We all begin from nothing and ultimately return to nothing. Objectively, that's the essence of life. Nothing more and nothing less. But is that all there is? What happens after we die? That's life's biggest mystery. Which is why things get considerably more interesting when we delve into the diverse beliefs we share surrounding what awaits us after we pass away. Notably, neurologists have recently uncovered a surge in brain activity at the moment of our departure from this world, suggesting that our brain would replay our most memorable memories. In other words, our lives literally flashes before our eyes. This discovery challenges our understanding that what we perceive around us may not necessarily reflect the full truth, which is why the story of the Pollock twins interests me so much. Before we dive into the story, a quick heads up. What we're about to discuss might be somewhat controversial as we explore the concept of reincarnation. I want to clarify that the reason I created this video as well as any content on my channel is all out of pure fascination. My goal is not to preach about a particular belief, but rather, I'm only sharing stories that I personally find intriguing. But enough introduction, let's begin the video. In the early 1940s, a couple from Northeast England, John and Florence, fell in love. Despite their differing beliefs, one Catholic and the other Protestant, they chose to marry. Soon after, they exchanged vows and set up their household in Northeast England. They appeared to be a typical couple living a successful life through their ownership of a grocery and dairy delivery business. However, the challenges they would face as a couple would go beyond the ordinary. In 1946, they welcomed their first child, a daughter named Joanna. Five years later, when the family relocated, Jacqueline joined the family. Because of their active involvement in their family business, the parents often entrusted the care of their daughters to their maternal grandmother while they were away. Perhaps to compensate for their parents' absence, Joanna, the older sibling, took on a nurturing role toward Jacqueline who never expressed any discontent with her sister's care. On top of that, the sisters were very well behaved, not only with one another but also when interacting with other children. In the beginning, everything seemed to be perfect for the Pollock family. Although the parents may occasionally be absent, the children never complained. That is, until the morning of May 7, 1957, when the girls were walking down the street to the church with their friend. A car suddenly veered toward them, abruptly ending their lives. The driver happened to be a local woman who had chosen to end her life by driving. After losing custody to her own children by consuming what she believed to be fatal doses of aspirin and phenobarbitone, Eyewitnesses recounted her erratic driving, and she seemed to be heading straight for the children. Tragically, there was no escape for them, as they were hemmed in by a wall alongside the sidewalk. The collision propelled them into the air, with a force described as akin to cricket balls, and both young lives were instantly extinguished. The incident made headlines across Britain. Their parents were understandably devastated for such a traumatizing event to occur to their daughters out of all people. We all have unique ways of coping with grief. And for John, his coping mechanism was to strengthen his faith even further. You see, John held a belief that was not particularly in line with his religious teachings. From the moment I knew she was pregnant, I believed that the girls would come back. This belief had its roots in a novel he had read when he was just nine years old, which had sparked his enduring fascination with the concept of reincarnation. Over the years, this fascination had solidified into a profound belief. In the midst of his struggle to come to terms with the loss of his two beloved daughters, he fervently wished for their souls to be reborn. In an interview, John revealed that he had experienced visions of his daughters in heaven. He longed to be close to them, often spending hours in their room, 
John, however, grappled with a sense of punishment for holding such an unconventional belief that diverged from his religion. At the same time, he never abandoned the hope that his prayers would, in some way, be answered. Maybe in an attempt to console his wife or perhaps to alleviate his own conscience, John confided his visions to her. Understandably, Florence, grappling with her own struggles in accepting their loss, didn't embrace his beliefs. Instead, this revelation ignited a heated argument between them, placing their marriage in jeopardy. As with any pain, time gradually began to heal their wounds. A year later, Florence was filled with hope as she discovered that she was expecting once more. On October 4th, 1958, the couple welcomed twin girls into the world, Gillian and Jennifer. Their arrival brought unexpected surprise because, according to their doctor, all indications had suggested that Florence was carrying a single child. These signs included palpation, fetal heartbeat, and the absence of twins in either parent's family history. What's striking about the twin that even Florence couldn't help but notice was the scar coming across her forehead, down onto the bridge of her nose, which was the identical scar to the Jacqueline, the younger one of the girls that had been killed, had had when she fell off a little tricycle when she was about two years old. Also, I, mean, I didn't see at the time, but later, my wife said to me, it's an incredible thing, but she's also got the birthmark on her left hip that Jacqueline had. Jacqueline had a birthmark on her left hip, which was like a brown thumbprint. Now, the similarity didn't just end there. As they grew a little older, Gillian and Jennifer began to exhibit behaviors similar to Joanna and Jacqueline. They were very close to one another with Gillian often taking on a nurturing role toward Jennifer, as was Joanna to Jacqueline. And just like their late sisters, their kindness didn't just stop between themselves but to other children as well. When their parents introduced them to the toys once belonging to their late sisters, Gillian immediately took Joanna's doll, whereas Jennifer claimed Jacqueline's. Both girls said the dolls were their Christmas presents from Santa Claus. When I got these two <clears throat> dolls out, one said, oh, that's Mary and that's Susan. And it was exactly the same names as my other daughters had named them. And that was the sort of really turning point in my way of thinking. When Gillian saw a toy clothes ringer that had also been a Santa Claus present to Joanna, she said, there's my toy ringer, adding that Santa had brought it. Typically, children would quarrel over which toys are theirs and which are not. But in the case of the twins, they showed an unusual dynamic as they immediately knew which ones were theirs and quarreled over none. Perhaps the darkest and most peculiar incident occurred when the parents took the twins to their old city for the first time in three years. Well, when we came at the top of Battle Hill, they came over the brow, approaching St. Mary's Church, which they couldn't see. One turned to the other and said, all oh, the schools are around here, which we used to go to, and the playgrounds around the back. Now, they couldn't possibly have seen any sign of a school or a church even. I mean, they were so small, they couldn't even have seen over the wall. And uh, sure enough, I mean, the school is round the corner. And this was the most incredible thing. And we continued to walk on. I mean, we were absolutely amazed at this. And as we came past the church, on the opposite side of the road is Hexham Abbey and the Abbey grounds. And um, one turned and said, oh, the playground's over there. Florence even noticed how carefully they walked the sidewalk, firmly holding hands. At one point, when a vehicle started nearby in an alleyway, the girls clung to each other and began shouting, The car! The car! It's coming for us! Once, Florence came across Gillian cradling Jennifer's head and saying, The blood's coming out of your eyes. That's where the car hit you. This was not only a knowledge and statement beyond what a typical three-year-old could comprehend, but it also eerily aligned with what happened to Jacqueline. According to their father, Jacqueline's head was bandaged above the eyes when he identified the bodies after the accident. Their remarkable story caught so much attention to the extent that the Sydney Morning Herald newspaper featured a column about them. 
in 1966. Additionally, a doctor from India who served as the director of the Department of Parapsychology at Rajasthan University in Jaipur was so intrigued by their story that he flew directly to their home to document this extraordinary story. Their story also piqued the interest of Ian Stevenson, an American psychiatrist and the founder and director of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine. Similar to Dr. Hemendra, Stevenson visited the family at their home, conducted extensive interviews with their parents, and examined the girls for birthmarks. However, Stevenson took his investigation a step further by examining the twins' blood, which led to a startling discovery. He found that Gillian and Jennifer were monozygotic twins, meaning they were genetically identical. This discovery made it even more challenging to explain how the girls' birthmarks came to be. Ian Stevenson went on to write a book about the Pollock twins, presenting their case as one of the most compelling pieces of evidence supporting the existence of reincarnation. It's not surprising that their story has been met with a fair share of skepticism. One such critique comes from the British historian Ian Wilson, who pointed out that Stevenson's evidence was inherently weak. Wilson argued that the only witness to the girls' behavior were their parents, and one of them was a strong believer in reincarnation. This bias could potentially taint the objectivity of their observations. According to Wilson, living in the same family as the deceased girls, the twins might have acquired knowledge of their older sisters through conventional means means, such as overhearing their parents' conversations. It's also worth noting that an important detail is missing in the story. In the story, which is the absence of any mention of the twins' four older siblings. Building on Ian Wilson's critique, it's fair to wonder whether these siblings played a role in influencing the twins' behavior. Moreover, there's a notable gap in the narrative regarding how they coped with the loss of their older sisters after the tragic incident. These omissions raise questions about the full context of their experiences and the potential factors that may have influenced their actions. Unfortunately, those are the only reasonable explanations I could find during my research for this video. I wholeheartedly acknowledge the range of perspectives their story might elicit, as it is undoubtedly a unique and perplexing narrative. But regardless of our divided opinions, what remains true is that their story serves as a reminder for us that there are a lot of things that we don't know in this life. Perhaps for some of you, it might even push you enough to consider the uncertainty that surrounds us. But the fact still remains. What actually happened to the Pollock twins?